All right. Well, thank you all for joining us here today for our press briefing with regard to um, the uh, state's response to the pandemic and other topics that we have here today. As always, we want to remind people that we still do have a pandemic, so it is still important that people continue to follow all the rules and use the tools we've given you with regard to slowing the spread of the virus, which means avoid the three C's. If you've um, got that cough, that fever, that lost the sense of taste and smell, please stay home. Go get tested through Test Nebraska or another venue, but don't go out and spread the virus around. We wanna make sure that we're reducing that. We've seen our positivity rate increase over the last couple of weeks. So we wanna to continue to slow that down. Uh, make sure you wash your hands often, wear a mask when you go to the store, all that sort of good stuff. So please continue that. Um, of course, uh, we do still have people in the hospital with coronavirus, about 168 folks. If you look over the last six days or so, that's been pretty stable, but we wanna keep people out of the hospital. So please continue to do that. We still do have very robust hospital capacity. 37% of our hospital beds are available. 37% of our ICU beds are available. So we wanna keep it that way. Please continue to help slow the spread of the virus, even as we get people vaccinated. And that's um, uh, kind of the good news. We have over 750,000 Nebraskans now have received at least one dose of the vaccine. And overall, there's been a, over a million vaccines that have been delivered uh, since December when we started receiving vaccines. Uh, Nebraska ranks fifth best in the nation with vaccinating vulnerable populations. We're uh, 11th best in doses for 65 people or older. We're 16th best in the um, 18 years and older category and we rank about 21 as far as the fully vaccinated at about 20% of our population being fully vaccinated. Uh, again, we want people to sign up to get that vaccine. You can go to vaccinate.ne.gov, vaccinate.ne.gov, or if you don't have a computer, call 1-833-998-2275 to be able to get signed up for that. Also, there's the federal pharmacy, retail pharmacy program that was expanded. You can check your local pharmacy to be able to see if they've got vaccines available and get that scheduled. Now, you may recall last week, I said that uh, we were gonna get about 5 million extra, or to be not we the state of Nebraska, but we the country would get about 5 million doses of Johnson & Johnson. Uh, the state of Nebraska got 27,600 of those. Uh, this week, however, that number is being reduced nationwide to about 700,000 and about 3,300 in the state of Nebraska. So we'll have a lot less of Johnson & Johnson available this week. However, we will still have, uh, continue to have robust supplies of both Moderna and Pfizer, uh, the same sort of categories, um, you know, 25,000 of the Pfizer, 19,000 Moderna and so forth. So we still will have those, they'll be available for vaccines. Also in the category of uh, good news, last week we had a day where we delivered over 30,000 vaccines in one day, and that was a new record for us. So we're very excited about that. All right, so we uh, do have some changes to the directed health measure based on some CDC guidance and some additional uh, information we want to update you on. And so we have um, uh, uh, our deputy director for the Department of Health and Human Services, Felicia uh, Quintana Zinn is here to be able to talk about that. So she's gonna come up and answer some questions about the DHM and then we'll have uh, Jason Jackson, who is our uh, Chief Human Resources Officer, as well as the um, uh, Director for the Department of Administrative Services to talk about some of our military and veteran-friendly programs that we have going on that we're gonna be expanding. And we have a couple members of our military that are gonna be talking about that as well. But we'll start with Felicia. So Felicia, you wanna come up, please? Thank you very much, Governor. All right, so good morning, everybody. So I'll be providing an update today on um, the COVID variants um, and the medical events that were reported on Friday. Um, so as of last Friday, DHHS, in collaboration with NPHL, so the Nebraska Public Health Laboratory, Creighton University, CHI, the College of Public Health, and the CDC have identified 237 variants of concern 
among Nebraskan re residents. So 187 of those were the B117 or the UK strain, 48 were the B1429 slash 427, which is the California strain, and two are a P1 or the Brazil strain. So we are seeing increasing proportions of the specimens that we're testing. Of the variants that are present in Nebraska, the predominant one is the B117 or the UK strain. And this one is believed to be more contagious and more severe um, than our standard or the wild type of COVID-19. Among patients that um, we have identified variants of concern in Nebraska, six have been hospitalized. And these numbers are really small um, and reflect a sim similar proportion of hospitalizations as our standard COVID-19 or our wild type. Additionally, regarding significant medical events reported on Friday, so DHHS and Douglas County Health Departments were made aware of a significant medical event that occurred in Douglas County resident who had received the Johnson & Johnson Janssen vaccine two weeks prior. The medical event was identified as a thromboembolic event, more commonly known as blood clots. The patient and the patient's family deserve their privacy and our thoughts and our prayers are with them. So any significant medical event that occurs after vaccination is taken very seriously and it's thoroughly investigated. Nebraska Medicine, CDC, Douglas County, and DHHS are working closely together to ensure that any po potential connection to the vaccine is investigated. So our national data suggests that the Johnson & Johnson Janssen vaccine continues to be safe and effective vaccine. And analysis of the phase three clinical trial data with approximately 40,000 people enrolled showed sim similar rates of embolic and thrombotic events between those who received the vaccine and those who received the placebo. And those who received the vaccine, 14 people are about 0.06% develop such events, and in those that receive the placebo, 10 people, or 0.05% develop such events. So for perspective, among all um, 1.9 million Nebraskans, 2,221 have died from COVID. So our case fatality, um, so those who pass away after having a COVID infection is just over 1%. So this is over 16 times um, more than what they experienced for these types of events in, um, during that trial. So ongoing safety monitoring in VAERS, um, so the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System through the CDC and the FDA has been reassuring. Less than 10 events similar to what this patient experienced have been described throughout the United States among all of those that have been vaccinated from any of the vaccines available. Close monitoring of the safety data has not revealed any concerning patterns regarding these rare medical events. And individuals that are concerned about vaccinations or have any questions about their safety should discuss their concerns with their medical provider. So as I close, I wanna remind everyone that, the, that Nebraska is now phase 2B which means that anyone in the state 16 and older can get vaccinated. And there are several options available to you. Register through um, vaccinate.ne.gov or with your local health district. And you can also check with area pharmacies that may be scheduling appointments. Please schedule your vaccination today and help Nebraska finish strong. Um, additionally, the governor had um, mentioned about the directed health measures um, for those, the CDC did release out um, in late March some updates with regards to um, those that have completed antibody tests. So those that have um, a positive antibody test, that is an EUA um, test, a approved test, are not required to quarantine um, if it's within um, three months, excuse me, uh, three, 30 days, I'm sorry, 30 days of the, um, of the test being completed. So um, we will have those updated DHMs out for everybody a little bit later on this week. Um, 
And I'll turn it back over to you, Governor. Great, thanks. So just uh, on that last bit, again, what that means is if you've got an, had an antibody test, it shows you've got the antibodies, right? You've got to have a positive test result. You can't have a negative test result. But if you had the positive test result to show that you've got the antibodies and you get exposed, you don't have to quarantine uh, like you normally would. But you will uh, still have to wear a mask when you go out in public, but you would not have to quarantine. So that's part of the new DHM that will be updating uh, in accordance with the CDC guidance out there on that. So please keep that in mind. All right. So we have a number of guests now that are going to be talking about our programs that we have here in the state of Nebraska to assist our military spouses and our veterans. Uh, Jason Jackson, our Director of the Department of Administrative Services and our Chief Human Resources Officer Hill, is here, as well as Nicole Rayner, who's the Chief Strategy Officer for the Nebraska Department of Economic Development. Jason's going to be talking about our military spouse transition program, which you'll get into more details about how we can help our military spouses who are coming to Nebraska be able to get a job with the state of Nebraska. And then Nicole is going to be talking about the Skill Bridge program, which is for our active duty military that are going to be looking to leave the military and uh, transition into uh, civilian life. And we want to have them transition here in Nebraska. And along that uh, line, we will have two guests, uh, U.S. Navy Commander Chris Cerro, who is going to be uh, talking a little bit about this program, as well as uh, uh, we have um, Master, Master Sergeant, right? That right? Yeah, Master Sergeant Tanner Wagner, who is going to be uh, talking about the program as well. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and start by calling Jason up to talk a little bit about the military spouse transition plan. Jason? Thank you, Governor Ricketts. I'm Jason Jackson, the Director of the Department of Administrative Services and a U.S. Navy veteran. And so today it's my pleasure to share more about the Military Spouse Transition Program. The governor's objective uh, and aspiration for the state of Nebraska is that Nebraska be the most veteran and military-friendly sta uh, state in the country. And he's uh, asked state government to be a leader in that. And this initiative is state government's latest operational step towards achieving that aspiration. A big problem for military families is the ability of spouses to be able to continue their careers when the active duty service member has a new assignment in a new geography. It's really disruptive to the family um, when every two years it would be, is typical, a military service member will have a new duty station. Um, and invariably that means um, spouse needs to assist the family in terms of setting up a new home um, and, uh, and then look for their next career opportunity if they themselves are pursuing uh, professional pursuits. And so that's a, a big challenge that military families face. And if state government and Nebraska can assist and come alongside families in helping them overcome those challenges as military service members are transitioning, that takes a big step, again, towards making Nebraska a very military-friendly state. We took a big step towards achieving that with the passage of LB 639 uh, that was signed into law by the governor in 2017, which enables state government to extend a preference to the spouses of active duty service members who are stationed here in Nebraska with respect to their application for a state government job opportunity. This latest initiative, the Military Spouse Transition Program, builds upon that success. And basically what we'll be doing in state government operations and state personnel within the Department of Administrative Services is coming alongside military families and spouses to provide them with career services, resume building services, networking opportunities, and job search um, uh, services to help them find an employment opportunity in state government. Um, this is an important step, again, to enabling uh, military veterans to be able to transition uh, with ease into Nebraska. So what we'll be doing is when uh, military service members have a new assignment and an active duty command here in Nebraska, uh, we'll be working with that family and the spouse to try to find them an employment opportunity in state government if that's their aspiration. We'll be looking to build upon this program in the coming months with outreach to our active duty component commands 
as well as building partnerships and reciprocal arrangements with other states that also aspire to participate. So we're really excited about the future of this program, but these services are available now to spouses of active duty service members who are transitioning into the state of Nebraska. Uh, military families and spouses wishing to learn more uh, can visit our website at das.nebraska.gov backslash personnel backslash SOS backslash military or simply uh, go to das.nebraska.gov and find the personnel tab and they'll be able to very intuitively navigate uh, to that page and find employment opportunities and assistance specifically geared towards military families and their spouses and job opportunities throughout state government operations. With that, I'd like to introduce Nicole Reiner, our Chief Strategy Officer with the Department of Economic Development, who will talk further about our DOD Skill Bridge partnership and what that means for the state. Thank you, Governor Ricketts, for this opportunity. First and foremost, I would like to thank Director Jackson, Director Goins, and especially Governor Ricketts for the opportunity to discuss this very important program for Nebraska and military veterans. I'm Nicole Reiner, Chief Strategy Officer for the Department of Economic Development. And like Director Jackson and uh, Director Goins, I am also a retired military veteran, go Navy. And I hold the title of military spouse as my husband continues to serve on active duty at Offutt Air Force Base. Every year, approximately 200,000 members of the military stationed all over the world will transition into civilian life. Of those 200,000, approximately 100,000 of those are located in our very own backyard of Offutt Air Force Base. These highly skilled professionals either re-enter the workforce or pursue a higher education, or like myself, do both. Additionally, every single soldier, sailor, airman, and Marine, many of whom have families, have the opportunity to select where they would like to locate and settle down and put down roots. So why not Nebraska? These highly trained individuals and their spouses are the perfect match for employers across our state who are in great need of workforce talent. Our goal is, is to encourage them to choose Nebraska as a place to live, work, and raise their families. DOD's SkillBridge program offers a way to create linkages between our nation's transitioning military and spouses or dependents and our Nebraska employers and communities. SkillBridge connects service members with real world industry partners during and up to their final 180 days of service. This relationship provides direct job skills training and work experience and gives participants a chance to explore their best fit talents and interests. Best of all, this program is totally and completely free to participating organizations since the member is still receiving their active duty pay and entitlements. Employers, meanwhile, can develop the SkillBridge program to address their specific labor needs. A number of national companies that operate here in Nebraska are currently participating in SkillBridge to include Allo Communications, Amazon, Google, and Lowe's, just to name a few. Any company or organization can get involved by simply contacting us. Starting this Thursday, my team and I will be hosting weekly webinars to answer questions and assist in registering. Best of all, we have two SkillBridge program participants, Navy Commander Chris Sero and Air Force Master Sergeant Tanner Wagner at the ready to provide insight on how to make your organization stand out and attract the talent you are looking for. Our department looks forward to working with employers and industries statewide to bring this program to fruition. Interested parties are encouraged to contact us or contact me for more information. Meanwhile, we will continue to make information available to the public as the program rollout continues. We'll also be working with our contacts at Offutt Air Force Base and the Nebraska National Guard to ensure information is available to all transitioning military personnel. Thank you again for your support as we work to make Nebraska the best state in America for our nation's military family. Once again, I would like to introduce Governor Ricketts. All right, thank you, Nicole. So we're having Chris and Tanner come up and talk here though, aren't we? Or are they not coming up and talk? That wasn't the intention. Oh, that wasn't the intention. Okay, well, gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, being here today to uh, support the SkillBridge program, and thank you very much for your service to our country. We really appreciate it. All right, so next we will uh, 
get into questions and answers here in just a moment, but our upcoming schedule will be for 10 a.m. next Monday. We will celebrate Rodeo Week at the governor's residence, one of my favorite press briefings we have all year long. I get to wear some jeans and cowboy boots. So we'll be, um, then, uh, so we'll do that 10 a.m. on Monday, and then our next press briefing will be Wednesday, 10 a.m. here. So with that, we'll get into some of the questions and answers. Uh, we'll start with Lee uh, Waldman from WWT. Uh, Governor Ricketts, are there any plans in the works to follow suit with places like Georgia, North Carolina, and Iowa in suspending the use of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine? And the answer to that is no. As uh, Felicia was talking about, in the clinical trials with Johnson & Johnson, the sort of blood clot incidences that we saw here in Nebraska happened 0.06% of the time in people who had received it, 0.05% of the time in people who had received the placebo. If you think about 0.06 versus 0.05, that's almost the same thing. So in the, the, the trials, the incident of having this blood clotting was about the same whether you got the vaccine or whether you got the placebo, which did not have to do with the vaccine. Also, as Felicia was pointing out, your risk of dying from getting COVID is much greater than a risk of even having one of these incidents. Uh, with a 0.06% of the time getting a blood clot as incident versus a uh, little over 1% time, as uh, Felicia was talking about, you're about 16 or 17 times more likely to die of COVID than even having a blood clotting incident. So again, the, the key message here is all these vaccines are safe and effective. You're gonna be at much greater risk of getting COVID than you are uh, with uh, some of the side effects these vaccines have. So please get the vaccine. And that's ultimately how we work our way through this pandemic. Also, do we have any reports of adverse reactions in people here after receiving their shot of J&J? &J? And uh, there was the, uh, again, Felicia referenced this from Friday as well, the individual who had received a shot of J&J &J, then also had a blood clotting incident. So we have uh, received one of those here in Nebraska. And as Felicia also indicated, that is being investigated by the CDC. So all these reports, if there's anything that uh, is associated with getting a vaccine that all gets turned into the CDC and they do their investigation. All right, uh, Kent Lutzen from KMTV asks, today the White House released a state-by-state -state list of urgent infrastructure needs along with proposed investments by Biden's um, American Jobs Plan. Uh, Nebraska infrastructure received a C- grade on infrastructure report card. What's your response to that grade? Well, if you go look at some of the other outside sources like the Reason Foundation, uh, we have historically scored very high when it comes to infrastructure. And in, I think, uh, Taylor, you're gonna have to help remind me, we were number 12 this year from the Reason Foundation. So still in the top quartile of states with regard to how we're doing with regard to our infrastructure. And then uh, follow on question, and in what ways is the state investing in its infrastructure program, uh, specifically affordable housing? So the state in the past has done our Rural Workforce Housing Program, LB 518. Uh, we had LB 866, was that the, the last year? Yeah, 866, which is our uh, in, middle income workforce housing. So the state has continued to invest in workforce housing. Though I do wanna make the distinction, that's not infrastructure, that's not roads and bridges, that is about affordable housing. And that's a great distinction to draw with Biden's plan. Uh, uh, if you look at Biden's infrastructure plan, only about 5% actually goes to roads and bridges. And even if you want to get more expansive in how you de define infrastructure, includes things like mass transit, uh, the $80 billion in a bailout for Amtrak, even if you include that in infrastructure, you're talking about 16% of the program is actually real infrastructure. The rest is a lot of the other programs the Democrats try to get funded through for other sorts of things, but it's not infrastructure. So I think that's one of the, the key fallacies of this plan is that it's actually not an infrastructure bill. It's a thinly disguised way to spend more money on the things the Democrats have been trying to spend money on for a long time. And Taylor, do we have any other questions that were sent in ahead of time? So Alyssa with uh, KMTV wants to know when we're going to appoint members of the uh, Gambling Commission. And so uh, we're still working through the process on that. And when we have the members appointed, we'll be ready to announce it. Martha at the World Herald says the legislation budget, budget package includes nearly $50 million for paying a new prison. Lawmakers have said that does not commit the state to building a new prison, and no construction will begin unless lawmakers appropriate funds to do so. Do you 
you agree that the state should not be permitted to build a new facility? So Martha, the Omaha World Herald is asking about the money that is set aside in the budget to do the planning for building a replacement prison for the Nebraska State Penitentiary. And the leg legislators have said this doesn't commit us to actually uh, building a replacement prison but doing the planning work. And of course that is actually accurate. The appropriation to actually uh, start the construction of a replacement prison is not in the, the budget package. It is a planning uh, program. But the fact of the matter is the Nebraska State Penitentiary is nearing the end of its lifetime. lifetime. And action has to be taken. The legislature has two choices. They can either invest in the current facility to bring it up to speed to last for another 50 years, whatever, uh, or they can build a replacement for the Nebraska State Penitentiary, which is what we are recommending. So it's a parallel process right now that we're going down with regard to uh, moving forward on the planning for a replacement prison for the Nebraska State Penitentiary, as well as doing our efforts around CJI. These are parallel processes. One doesn't go forward without the other. So it's a work in progress that goes, you know, both of them going forward. And that's the, the plan we have right now, just to continue to uh, press forward on both of them. But at the end of the day, the legislature is going to have to make a decision. Are you going to, you know, put money into the current facility, which was built in 1869 and really was not designed for modern correctional uh, operations like doing programming to help make sure inmates don't reoffend and then come back into our system? Or are you going to build a modern correctional facility that will allow for things like programming that will also help keep our inmates and correctional officers safer? So uh, we've recommended building replacement that will allow us to have those modern operations so that we can do programming, keep our officers and inmates safer. And that's the path we're on with regard to uh, doing some of the planning around that. But uh, as Martha indicated, that the money has not been appropriate to actually do the construction. Paul Hamill says, can, the, can you comment on the lawsuit filed prior to the Oklahoma seeking abortion? Paul Hamill, the Omaha. So Paul Hamill is asking, uh, can I comment on the litigation with regard to the inmate who's seeking an abortion? And was I involved in the decision? And because it's pending litigation, I cannot comment on it. And so Paul, Holm is, Paul Hamill is also asking, can I comment on the rumor that uh, Governor Heineman is considering a run for governor? And, uh, you know, when candidates actually officially announce, I, I'll comment on, on then, but uh, I'm not going to comment on rumors. Is the governor backing a candidate in the race for governor? And then Paul asked, am I backing a candidate in the race? And I certainly, as I previously indicated, it was my intention to uh, get, get back a candidate in the race in 22, but I have not gotten behind any candidate at this point. John at WWC says, uh, do you think that there's enough support to build a new prison in the state uh, and is the one proposed big enough? Uh, John at WWT wants to know, is there enough support within the legislature to build a replacement prison and is the one that we're proposing big enough? And again, this is a replacement prison for the uh, Nebraska State Penitentiary. It does add on a couple hundred beds, but it's not about, the proposal that we made is not about expanding capacity. It's about replacing a facility that is going to be at the end of its useful lifespan here within the next decade. So this is something, the legislature ultimately will not have a choice about this. They will either have to invest a couple hundred million dollars in the old facility or take our plan, which is building a replacement facility that will allow modern cor correctional operations. That's not going to be a choice they have. They're going to have to do one or the other. So we're making progress going uh, down the path, and ultimately the legislature will have to do one or the other. And then he also asked, do you think that there could be money set aside to help fight some of the root causes that bring people into the criminal justice system? And so the question was, uh, do you think money could be set aside to fight some of the root causes with reasons why people come into the criminal justice system? And of course, we already do that in a number of different programs to be able to help people with that. And with regard to how we look at specifically uh, our corrections operations, things like probation and parole, that's part of the parallel process with the Crime and Justice Institute to do a study over the course of the next year, look at some of our data and see where, how we might be able to improve some of those operations. Why is it important to vaccinate 
So uh, Ruta Olsenaida at, I'm sorry, was that, what channel was that again? Cam TV, sorry, is asking about Pfizer seeking an emergency use authorization to use its vaccine on younger children ages 12 to 16, is that correct? Uh, 12, to 12 to 15, because there we got 16 year olds. 12 to 15, and what do I think about uh, vaccinating children and so forth? Uh, again, we'd have to go uh, see what the data is when, uh, and I have not had a chance to review any of the data from Pfizer. However, uh, while younger folks are much less at risk, they still have the capability of transmitting the virus. So I think that, uh, you know, having that emergency use authorization for younger folks is a good idea. Ultimately, it would be up to the parents to decide whether or not those children would get the vaccine. How will, how will vaccines look different from vaccinating adults? How will vac uh, vaccinating kids be different from vaccinating adults? Obviously, parents would have to give consent for their child to be able to get the vaccine. And, uh, you know, for example, you could reach a number of children uh, by doing vaccine, mass vaccination clinics like we do today, or you could do them at school, so I'm not sure it's going to be that much different, uh, other than the parents would have to give the permission to be able to uh, get the vaccine. Julie, you have another question, but I think uh, Felicia can answer. Is the state tracking the reporting, obviously, based on how many uh, of those being hospitalized were already vaccinated for coronavirus? Are any of those hospitalized recently vaccinated? And is the state tracking the reporting the number of deaths among vaccinated people? So Julie, at the Omaha World, Julie Anderson, the Omaha World Herald, wants to know, is the state tracking of people who are being um, admitted to the hospital, had they had a vaccine already? Are we tracking people who have received the vaccine and then go to the hospital and then die? That sort of data. Felicia, do you want to come up and talk just a little bit about that, please? Okay. Hi, everybody. All right. So we are tracking that. Um, so we, we do track that with regards to um, breakthrough um, for after vaccine for infections. So we follow the CDC definition. We have identified 122 as of last Friday um, possible vaccine breakthroughs among Nebraskan residents um, with positive tests. So they have to be um, 14 days after they have completed a vaccination series. So that's either one shot for the J&J &J or um, two shots for the Moderna or Pfizer. So out of the 428,000 Nebraskans fully vaccinated, this represents just 0.03%, indicating that the vaccine is working for more than 99, excuse me, for more than 99% of people who receive it. And we have the most confidence in about 28 of those individuals for whom we've had, uh, we've been able to do genomic sequencing on. Um, and in order to be successful at that, we have to have a high level of virus that's present in the specimen that the, that the patient provided. And so for, for that, we have identified um, three individuals that have been vaccinated and that have been hospitalized. Um, please keep in mind that this is over, that this is out of over 6,390 uh, individuals that have been hospitalized throughout the pandemic so far. And um, this accounts for about 0.05% of our COVID-19 hospitalizations. And again, um, like with the other information that I shared earlier on the variants, these numbers are extremely small. Um, I did want to really quick um, provide just a clarification I did misspeak a little bit with regards to the antibodies. Um, it's for unvaccinated people that have tested antibody, antibody positive within three months um, before or immediately following an exposure. So um, these individuals, again, don't, do not have to quarantine unless they develop symptoms, then they will need to isolate. So that is just the correction I wanted to make sure. No, there's no deaths at this time. Thank you. So again, Julie, just to be clear, there were no deaths among the three uh, hospitalizations of people who had been vaccinated prior time. And again, just to emphasize Felicia's point, 99, over 99% of the time, this is being effective. So incredibly effective in keeping people out of the hospital and having those 
severe reactions that can lead to death. Grant Schulte wants to know where can people get antibody tests and is this something the state is offering? The state is not offering antibody tests, so you'd have to procure that on your own. The state is not paying for that. And where can people get antibody tests? Can they go to their doctor and get that? So you can reach out to your uh, medical provider or some pharmacies have antibody tests as well. So Madison from 1011 is asking, are we at a tipping point now with regard to vaccines? Is it a point where it's just about getting them in people's arms? Well, obviously we've been trying to get that in as quickly as possible. Uh, I think what we're seeing is that we're seeing more of the scheduled clinics have openings. Uh, I think this week may be a little bit different with regard to, for example, the federal retail pharmacy program because we're not gonna have all the supply of Johnson & Johnson in pharmacies. But I know that uh, last week when we had a lot of Johnson & Johnson, there were openings at pharmacies as well. So, uh, I, 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 Madison, if you've got a follow-up question, maybe send it to Taylor. But it really what we're really trying to do is make sure that we ha get out the vaccines as quickly as possible to as many people as possible because getting vaccinated is how we work our way through this pandemic. Once we have enough people who have the vaccine and have developed antibodies so that the virus can't transmit, that's when we'll see you know, the, the transmission of the virus stop and our hospitalizations and so forth. She says, what would you say in the round of hesitance to get a vaccine? Why is it important to vaccinate the state? So uh, Madison is asking, why is it important to finish strong and why would I, uh, what would I say to uh, Nebraskans who are hesitant to get the vaccine? The vaccines have been demonstrated to be safe and effective and that key part is important. Both parts are important, but look, this is what's gonna keep you out of the hospital. It's gonna prevent you from dying if you get coronavirus. 1% of the people in our state, over 1% of the people in our state who've gotten the coronavirus have died from it. So this is a way you can protect yourself, protect your family from getting the virus by getting that vaccine. And ultimately, this is how we get back to, you know, a, normal life is by and getting through this pandemic is by getting people vaccinated because that's the only way there's only two ways to develop the antibodies one is by get vaccinated one is to get the virus you're going to be at a lot greater risk if you get the virus than you are if you get the vaccine all right other questions Uh, can we verify the status of the person who had the blood clot where they are right now? Dr. Antone or Felicia, do you want to address that? Dr. Antone, you want to come up and talk about that? As of last Friday, which is the last report we received about the uh, patient uh, with the blood clots, uh, they remain in the hospital um, at the University of Nebraska Medical Center in, in guarded conditions still. Thank you, Dr. Anton. You're the only one here. You get to keep asking questions. More of a storage question on the, with the volleyball tournament being held in Omaha, I didn't know if you had a comment on ESPN, how they were originally not going to broadcast the first two rounds, and now they are. I'm curious how you're feeling on that. Well, with regard to the volleyball tournament being held in Omaha, I think it's great for Omaha and the fact that ESPN is going to broadcast all of the games, uh, the first two rounds, which they were not going to do before. I think that's great as well. I think this is a, uh, obviously great that we're having sports, and it's a great chance to show off Omaha and the wonderful facilities we have. So uh, I think this is uh, just it's exciting that we've got the volleyball tournament going in the first place, and it's exciting that it's in Omaha. All right. Taylor, you got anything else? All right, folks, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Again, I hope everybody has a great week, but please continue to remember that we need to, even while we're getting people vaccinated and we've delivered over a million vaccines and 750,000 Nebraskans have received at least one dose. It's important to continue to take all the steps to slow the spread of the virus, like washing your hands frequently, keeping your six foot of distance between you and other people in public, wear a mask when you go to the store, avoid the three C's. All of that will help us make sure that we slow down this virus, keep people out of the hospital while we get people vaccinated. And again, please, let's finish strong, Nebraska. Get signed up to get those vaccines. You can go to vaccinate.ne.gov. 
call 1-833, toll free, 1-833-998-2275. If you don't have a computer, get signed up. We'll contact you when your turn is ready. We are really opening us up to anybody who is 16 and older across the state of Nebraska. So we want to get those vaccines in people's arms as quickly as possible so we can work our way through this pandemic. Thank you all again, and we'll catch up with everybody on Rodeo Day at 10 a.m. next week. Thank you, Francis. Ryan, you want to move our podium here? See, this is why I have you there. I would not have remembered to move that. 